My name is Nate. I run Jesus People SF, and today I want to talk about a cultural trend that I've noticed lately, both in and outside of so-called Christian circles, this obsession uh, with alpha male and beta male as conceptions of how to divide the world. And I just want to talk about why there's such an interest in this. I want to talk about whether it's a good thing or whether it's a bad thing and how we can think about that, especially from the text. Now, first, let's just establish that this is indeed something that's kind of become a very large trend in uh, our culture. So you can see here the, the topic alpha male is a lot more popular than beta male. Um, and this term arises from kind of the zoology, uh, the, the idea of pack animals and how they interact with one another, specifically males. Um, and it's basically a hierarchy system. And so there can be alpha males in a pack or a, I don't know how to describe it, a harem, um, an alpha male, an alpha female. Things can break down this way. But um, basically the idea is that one is more dominant um, and then the others are more submissive. So the beta is submissive, the alpha is dominant. And the dominance uh, typically involves ritualized displays of aggression or direct physical violence. It's so interesting to me that um, this obsession with alpha male, beta male, as some kind of paradigm for our society has popped up. Now, there is a big problem. I will, I will confess that there's a huge problem with um, man as a you know, gender being too effeminate in our modern era because of, I don't know, we'll just call it the hippie's fault um, in this regard, the sexual revolution, and the throwing off of all historic standards of how one should behave in the world since the 1960s, really. Um, all this stuff has led to kind of a breaking down of historic gender roles in society that were really healthy uh, for the most part. Um, and so there's, there's a desire for a return. The Red Pill movement wants people to, quote, level up who are men um, and get buff and work on yourself and work on your pickup skills and all this stuff. But it's so interesting. It's very beastly, this dominant stuff, this alpha stuff. Now, I'm not against a man being super dominant and super masculine. Like, that's, that's the way God made men. God made men to be strong. And, of course, God wants hierarchies. That's what a government is. A government is a hierarchy of power. Some people rise to the top. And lead. This is for the good of mankind. This is for good in general. Uh, our particular government in the United States has gotten too big. So it's a little bit of a beast itself. It is an alpha male. It dominates its own people. But um, I would say generally God wants hierarchies. He wants someone to be at the top. But the fact that this is all focused on dominance, it, it's really interesting. And this is a Wikipedia article talking about um, alpha and beta as you know terms for humans. But let me just let me just talk about the uselessness of being an alpha as far as you know an achievement, an achievement. So um, for instance, here's here's a bunch of people in the Bible who had what the world would consider alpha status. Here we've got Saul. And what is Saul? He's a dude that's taller than everybody else. What is what do the women want? They want a six foot tall guy who makes six figures. Um, and he's got a large member, right? Larger than that number. So um, it's so funny. And, and of course, you know, we could say it this way. How did Saul end his life? He ended with God deserting him, the spirit of God that was given to him for the role of being king was deserting him. And he died in battle when he could have simply given the throne to the rightful uh, choice of God, but he tried to kill the rightful choice of God. Oh, how alpha to chase God's man around a mountain to kill him just because you're jelly. Um, here we have um, a dude who's really rich. Here's Job. Um, Job is so rich. He's the greatest man of the East. 
And look at how quickly that deserted him when it was God's time for that to desert him. Now, of course, God did give it back to him. But just having a lot of stuff, just being really tall and, you know, the ladies loving you or what have you. And look, here's, here's a dude who's really pretty. This is Absalom. Absalom was, uh, there was none in Israel so praised as Absalom for his beauty. Oh, amazing. What an alpha. His beauty is so great. He usurped David, but it was part of God's judgment against David for stealing Uriah's wife Bathsheba. Um, and so it wasn't much of an achievement for one, Absalom to be pretty. It was just kind of given to him. And number two, he didn't use his gifts and abilities very well. And, you know, even a guy who is relatively esteemed like David, and you think, oh man, David was the greatest king of Israel. He was, he, everybody's compared to David, all the future kings after him, both the northern tribes of Israel in the north and the southern tribes of Judah in the south. All those kings were compared to David. But look, this is God's description of David. And when God is taking David to task for his behavior towards uh, Uriah and Bathsheba and toward God himself, God says this, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, this is God talking to Nathan, who has deli to deliver this message to David. And he says, Thus says the Yahweh Sabaoth, or the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. In other words, dude, you were just a shepherd. And let me just put it this way. In Israel, in that time, the shepherds were among the lower class, okay? And you, you can see this in David's behavior with his brothers. His brothers deride him all the time until he's, you know, actually got a position. His brothers deride him all the time. And when he, David goes up to the battle because of uh, the, the battle with uh, the Philistines and Goliath is there, David's brothers are in the army, and David is just delivering cheese to the army. And his brothers mock David. He's just supposed to be watching the sheep, in other words. And so God is just telling David, look, I'm the one who made you this alpha. I'm the one who gave you. David ha or Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. You see, being an alpha is not all that. And I want to talk about the, the most chief alpha in human history. Um, this gentleman named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was... As God himself describes, so we would call this an official position of God, Nebuchadnezzar was ruler of the earth, okay? And here, Nebuchadnezzar is giving, getting a dream, and in this dream, uh, it says, um, The king saw a watcher and the holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down, this tree represents Nebuchadnezzar, and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree from the Most High. This is Daniel giving the interpretation. They shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as the oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee. And so here is Daniel's admonition. He says, um, break off your sins and your iniquities and show mercy to the poor. That's basically what God expected from this pagan king. But look, here's Nebuchadnezzar the Alpha. And this came, came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel 4.29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, there fell a, word, a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And that's what it ultimately comes down to. I mean, we could say it this way. Um, the tallest people on earth that have all the girls, uh, the richest people on earth that have all the goods, they're the greatest men of the East. Um, the uh, most beautiful people on earth like Absalom, the people who are given rulership, their presence, prime ministers, dictators. Um, one day, uh, the kingdom will pass from them. All the alphaness that they have is going to depart 
like the dew of morning. It will be gone. It will be the heat of God's anger forever for them. And so here is Nebuchadnezzar. He gets this voice from heaven as he's boasting about his greatness, his alphaness. Oh, how great, how dominant he is over the nations. And it, he, it says here, they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be the beasts of the field. And that same hour, verse 33, the thing was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like an oxen. You know, oxen are, are pretty alpha. You don't want to walk up on an ox um, from like its periphery because it may charge against you. Oh, how alpha, right? This great king eats grass like an alpha oxen here. And his body is wet. So you see, it's so strange that we are so obsessed with alpha. And what is this colloquial term or this idiom we use about someone who's dominant on the sports field or in their job or making money? We call them, oh, that's a beast or you're a beast. It's this stuff right here. You know, even, even dogs that hump inanimate objects because of their horniness, dogs, cats, stuff that chews ground. These things can be alpha, right? And so this is the great thing we want to compare ourselves to. We want to compare ourselves to the beasts of the earth and call that great. In fact, one of the spiritual metaphors for Nebuchadnezzar and the whole kingdom of Babylon is a beast. One of the visions Daniel has given of Babylon is as one of four beasts. And this was one out of four kingdoms, the first of them. And, and so that's all the alphaness is. And so if all you want to be is dominant, then lift some weights and be mean to people. If all you want to do is make a lot of money, there's ways to do it, both, le both legal and illegal. If you want to get the girl, there's ways to do that, if, or the guy, or whatever. If you want people to like you, you can kiss butt. A lot of people do that. They spend their whole lives doing it, and they have nothing to them. And so I want to look at this concept of integrity as the real alpha, like the real thing to be esteemed, right? And look at this. It, it, uh, this is a definition of integrity that's just an engineering term, but it, it really gives light on what it is to have integrity. Like what is integrity? What is moral integrity? This is what integrity is. It's the same thing as like a metal, right? Structural integrity and failure is an aspect of engineering that deals with the ability of a structure to support a designed structural load. Can you handle the heat? Can you handle the pressure? You know, these idioms that we use to deal with stress and things like that. But this is moral pressure, moral uh, heat. The ability of a structure to support a designed load, weight, force, etc., without breaking. Now, you can be the alpha of alphas of alphas. You can even be a Nebuchadnezzar so that even God describes you as a great ruler of the earth. Or, or, or some, some ruler of an ancient time called a, a hunter, almighty. And yet, these people that achieve so much are just in the dust. They're, they're breathing just, well, they're not breathing. And they have no future past the point of their so-called conquests. It's ironic that Alexander the Great after he had conquered the world, breathed his last. In fact, he was uh, breathing his last in the ruins of Babylon. That's where he died. It's so ironic. And this, this phrase here in engineering, they say that structural integrity and failure includes the study of past failures in order to prevent failures and future designs. And so since even the beast can be dominant, even the beast can domineer. Even the beast can growl. Even the beast can get the girl and get the girls. A whole harem. Many, many animals have harems if you're the alpha. But that's not what's really impressive because even retarded creatures that can't read a book, that can't look up and ask deep questions, even these things can be dominant. But what they can't do to any real extent. Yes, dogs can be noble. Creatures can occasionally be noble. 
in some kind of moral sense, but nowhere near the nobility of keeping your integrity, keeping your morality under pressure. This is real integrity. This is holding your self together under weight, under force. When the whole culture pushes, burns, wants to bend you, can you hold yourself to a standard that will not move? This is integrity. And so, going back to the story of Nebuchadnezzar, listen to what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He ends up literally acting like a beast for seven years, okay? And so at the end of seven years, because this is the appointed period of this judgment and this decree of God for Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance and sins, at the end of seven, or excuse me, at the end of the days, at the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven and mine understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Do you see that? Do you see how he went from walking on the palace of Babylon, preaching to himself, of course. You are your greatest audience when you want to preach, right? Preaching to himself that he was the greatest of all men and of all kingdoms. And to be honest, even the Bible gives some credence to that. Nevertheless, Look at the lesson he learned by becoming this beastly thing that ate grass. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and God does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? And you see God who is this great despot. The descriptor that Nebuchadnezzar has there is one of a dictator, a despot. Let me see if I can find it since I scrolled past it. Um, yeah, and he says, um, none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? That's the power of a despot, a dictator. No one can veto a dictator in his own dominion, right? The dictator is absolute. And so God as dictator, ironically, is high and low. He's lofty. No one can stop him. But he has an eye to the poor. And do you see the reason for this decree even? It's because God has an eye to the poor. Look at this. O king, let thy counsel, this is the reason Nebuchadnezzar was made like a beast. Let, let my counsel be un, um, acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness and let thy iniquities, thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Mercy to the poor, if it may be the lengthening of thy tranquility. So you see this lofty God, this lofty God who reigns in the heavens, who can do whatever the frick he wants, and no one can tell him otherwise. He cares about the lowly. He cares in his might about things that are hurting. Now, he doesn't always address it in the moment, and that is a big complaint that I have. And by the way, many, if not most of the prophets have the exact same complaint to God. Uh, in their prayers and in their their writings. Nevertheless, God does care, and occasionally stuff like this happens where God says something terrible is going to happen to a ruler, and it does. I mean, just think about some of the things that have happened to people in Iran um, who are r ruling and reigning. Now, it could be that Mossad is pulling this stuff off, but it could also just be God is not having some of their behavior. So... Nevertheless, the real, the real achievement, if you want to be an alpha, is to be someone who is strong, dominant when you need to be, right? We don't want our soldiers being pushovers, right? We don't want cops being pushovers when they're in a firefight. But we also want strong people, alphas, who are not full of themselves and say, look at my kingdom, look at my might. Look at how great I am. And instead say stuff like, I am strong for the sake of this good, that good, this good, that good. So I'm not saying, you know, don't, don't be an alpha. Someone's got to rule. 
Someone's got to be a mayor. Someone's got to be a, a prime minister, a president, a senator. None of those things are bad in themselves, right? It's when the, the power and the authority becomes about you instead of about doing good through that power, through that strength, through that dominance, right? If you are an alpha, use that power for good. If you are someone much lower on the hierarchy, like, by the way, most people on the earth, then use your position well. Just do the right thing at all times. And when push comes to shove, when it comes to situations where the moral compass you've been given first in your conscience, right? Romans chapter two, um, Ro actually Romans chapter one says that all men have a conscience. I think Romans chapter three goes into more, but all men have a conscience. And he says to people who have the special revelation of God's word in chapter two, that a lot of times people who have the decrees of God, the laws of God, they just don't live by it. And so people who live by their conscience, who at least obey the conscience that God has given them, the laws that they do have among the pagans, God is at least a little honored by that. And the people who have God's word but don't live by it are shamed because they have the higher decrees, the higher commands, but they don't live by it, right? Most of the time. And so the real alphaness is, is not whether you are uh, tall or handsome, whether you have a lot of money or considered great by people, not whether you're beautiful. It's not whether even you're given great power like David was. And by the way, it was just given. That's, that's how David got to be who he was. He was given that. And it's not even whether you rule the whole earth. It, it's, it's trifling. It's, it's meaningless because ultimately God rules the whole earth and he does whatever he wants. So given the fact that we're all some subset of something God is doing, you should do what is right. You should be the person that God, dare I say, even if you're a pagan, even if you're out in the world, even if you're someone that has nothing to do with the Christian way or even the Jewish way, you should at least obey your conscience. You should be an alpha in that regard. And you should be someone that both has integrity and holds your yourself together in the midst of the heat of peer pressure and culture pressure and all these things and someone who studies the failures of others um so that you don't make the same mistakes and you know just something i i that came to mind there's a director that i esteem somewhat some of his movies are hard to watch because of moral content but when i was uh, a bigger movie buff than i am now i would watch Stanley Kubrick movies and Stanley Kubrick is one of the greatest directors of all time. No contest. Almost everyone will tell you the same. And Stanley Kubrick hated to watch really good movies because he felt like, you know, he just didn't learn anything. It, it was just too great. He, he couldn't actually learn lessons, right? Oftentimes when we study the greats, we, we just feel inferior. We feel like we can't measure up. But Stanley Kubrick said he loved to watch bad movies. Because he, he could learn things. He could say, oh, man, they should have done this. They should have done that. And the same thing with people's moral failures. You, you can look at the Bible. You can even look at people around you. Study the people around you. Try to figure out what they did wrong. Try to avoid what they did. And the old phrase, you know, insanity is just doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Everyone else has done many more things than you can do. So study their lives and make sure you don't repeat the same things that they're doing wrong. All right, so that's that's my take on, um, that's my position on alpha males, beta males. I'm not necessarily against it. I just think it's so stupid to, to want to be a beast, to want to be something that chews grass and is just powerful and dominant, and that's it. Like, really? We're so much better than that. We're so much greater than just domineering, having some kind of harem of people to sleep with. We're so much better than that. So live better than that because you were designed for it, period. Um, thanks for your time. Um, please like and subscribe if this was helpful. This will get the message out of this particular video without you having to do anything else beyond that. And uh, if you felt this was an interesting subject, leave a comment. If you didn't like this, leave your thoughts to yourself. I don't, I don't want your comment.